I do comedy, okay. play bad guys sometimes. Do you see Austin Powers? Uh -huh. Um, I played a little role in part one. Okay. You can find me on Wikipedia, believe it or not. <sighs> okay, go, let me tell you what the deal is here, okay? Young girl, 19 years old. You know, late at night, early morning, it was this evening, 24 December 1990. Driving home to the vehicle, the apartment complex is out on Burgers. Okay? She parks in the carport. Two guys jam her in the carport. They grab her, throw her in the car, drive her some distance away. That's bad. It's very bad. And the DNA tells us it's you. Okay. And wrong guy. Despite the weather and general lack of snow, Christmas in Huntington Beach, California is a lot like Christmas in the rest of the country. People celebrate, gather with loved ones, and observe traditional Christmas customs. Amongst those excited for the holidays was a 19-year-old woman only known by the alias Victoria. On December 23rd, 1990, Victoria and some friends had been out to admire the Christmas lights adorning much of the city. Along for the ride was Chassie, Victoria's small Pomeranian puppy. Victoria arrived home at her apartment complex around 12.30 a.m. and immediately noticed that the normally locked front gate to the complex was wide open. Additionally, the light above her assigned carport was flickering on and off, but most disturbingly, Victoria had the unmistakable feeling that she was being watched. As Victoria parked her car, she began hearing footsteps that sounded as though someone was coming through the gate. It was blisteringly cold that night. So Victoria put her dog snugly into her coat and began walking towards the apartment entrance. But as she did so, she saw what looked like a shadow on the sidewalk that quickly disappeared. Then immediately afterwards, a man appeared from out of nowhere on the path and began to quickly walk towards Victoria, shouting that he was lost and needed directions to the beach. As the man got closer, a second man with a cigarette in his hand appeared from behind. When the second man flicked his cigarette away, both attacked Victoria from the front and back. As Victoria was on the ground, the second man pulled out a gun with a silencer attached to it and said, quote, Bitch, you're gonna die tonight. I'm gonna throw you off the cliffs. As the two men began to drag Victoria away, her puppy, who was still in her coat pocket, bit the hand of the man with the gun. As he screamed out in pain, Victoria began to run away, but was unfortunately caught at the last second when one of the men was able to grab a handful of her hair. The two then began to beat Victoria on the sidewalk, when one of them asked Victoria a question. Do you see that? as he showed her that the other man had his gun pointed at the windows of Victoria's neighbors in the apartment complex. The man then said, The first one that hears you is gonna get their head blown off and you're gonna watch, so it's your choice. They then knocked Victoria out and threw her into their nearby vehicle and drove off. The two men then spent the next several hours driving around the city as they both repeatedly tortured and raped Victoria. As the man who seemed to be the leader kept repeating, I needed a beach girl for my Christmas present to myself. As the men drove around the city claiming they were looking for cliffs, Victoria remembered that in her wallet she had a picture of a friend's newborn baby. Thinking fast, she showed the men the picture and told them that they were going to let her live so she could see her son again. To which the leader replied, You really think I'm going to let you go after you've identified me? Victoria answered, You poked my eyes out with contacts in them. I can't see shit right now. A long moment of silence followed, with both men considering their options. But unfortunately, from that point, the torture would only get worse, as the leader then decided to violate Victoria with the barrel of his gun. 
as he claimed it had always been a fantasy of his to do so. He then stopped the car and threw a naked Victoria out onto the side of the road. He pointed his gun at Victoria's head, but then at the last moment the other man threw his jacket onto Victoria. The leader was enraged and shouted, What the fuck are you doing, man? To which he replied, Come on, man, she's cold. The leader then pointed his gun at Victoria again and began counting. One. Two. Merry Christmas. It's your lucky day. Run. Victoria then ran to a nearby house, whose occupants immediately phoned police upon hearing her story. Police arrived soon after and decided to take Victoria to the hospital, but she convinced them to first take her back to the scene of her abduction so she could look for her puppy. As they arrived, police started their investigation as Victoria began frantically searching the area and calling out her dog's name, but was unable to find her. Thinking that she died during the struggle, Victoria began to cry, but then a loud whining noise started to come from a nearby bush and from there emerged Chassie the Pomeranian. Victoria was so jubilant that even some of the nearby police officers began crying. At the hospital, Victoria was able to provide investigators with a detailed description of the appearance of both suspects, which was quickly given out to local media. Two unidentified male DNA samples were also recovered, but unfortunately they didn't match any other DNA samples on file. But despite this, police were initially optimistic that this crime would be solved quickly as they believed the two perpetrators had made a critical mistake, and that was repeatedly telling Victoria that they were members of a local street gang known as the Sons of Samoa. Further credence to this claim was added due to the fact that during the attack, the letters SOS had been carved onto Victoria's back end. Police immediately pursued this lead, and for over a year they monitored the gang's members and had informants feeding them information on the gang's activities. But this lead would ultimately prove to be a dead end, with detectives coming to the conclusion that this was nothing but a lie designed to mislead investigators. And with that, the case went cold. Police had no witnesses, no fingerprints, and no surveillance recordings. All they knew for certain was that one of the attackers was a Hispanic male, while the other was a heavy-set Asian male. Eighteen long years would pass before police would have another lead in the case, and during that time, both of the attackers would move on with their lives as if nothing had happened. One of these men would eventually be identified as Joe Sun who just four years after leading the attack on Victoria would make his mixed martial arts fighting debut on pay-per-view at UFC 4, where he was billed as a black belt in Taekwondo, as well as the founder of a new martial art he had created which he had ingeniously named Joe Sun Do. Despite being just 5 feet and 4 inches tall, Sun weighed in at 240 pounds and he was pitted against a fighter named Keith Hackney, who had notably beaten a 600 pound sumo wrestler at a previous UFC event. The fight between Sun and Hackney would go down in infamy due to a segment where Sun had a guillotine choke locked in, to which Hackney responded with a flurry of multiple punches to Sun's groin, which caused him to release the chokehold. Sun would eventually lose the fight by submission. The next year, Sun tried his hand at kickboxing, where he was again defeated, this time by being knocked out after a single kick to the head. From there, Sun tried to become an actor, starring in many obscure, low-budget movies such as Joshua Tree, Blood Fist 5, Human Target, and Bad Blood. I've been looking forward to this. Now don't underestimate him. He's dangerous. He's a driver, not a killer. I'm different. 
the only real success Sun would find in his acting career would come in 1997, when he was cast in the first Austin Powers film as Random Task, a parody of the character Oddjob from the James Bond movie Goldfinger. Despite appearing in many scenes and playing a prominent role in the film, Sun's acting career would come to an end and Random Task would prove to be his last on-screen role. And Sun would fade into obscurity until he returned to MMA in 2002 where he participated in three final fights. In his first fight, he infamously came to the ring wearing eye makeup, a bowler hat, and a tight leopard print thong. He then gave his opponent a big hug before the fight began. But unfortunately for the creator of Joe Sun Do, his return bout was short as not long into the fight, he voluntarily quit after his opponent took him down and he almost slid out of the ring, which Sun claimed caused him to injure his elbow. Sun's next fight was an even more pathetic display. As when his opponent landed a blow that caused Sun to start bleeding, he quit the fight on the spot, giving him the embarrassing distinction as being the only MMA fighter in history to have a loss recorded as quote, submission due to terror on their record. Sun would participate in his last MMA fight in July 2002, in which he again quit early after he was thrown onto his head by his opponent. In the end, Sun's official MMA record stands at 0 wins and 4 losses, while his kickboxing record stands at 0 wins and 1 loss. At this point, Sun retired from professional fighting altogether and moved back to California and lived a relatively quiet life. During this whole time, he was never once considered a suspect in Victoria's attack and he likely would have gotten away with it had it not been for an incident in May 2008 when he was arrested for felony vandalism after kicking in the car door of a former roommate. Sun was sentenced to 60 days in jail, which he served and was released on probation. In August of that year, Sun was again taken into police custody and sentenced to an additional 90 days in jail, after he violated the terms of his probation for failing to keep authorities updated on his current residence. As part of his plea deal, Sun was required to provide a DNA sample which in early October of 2008 was linked to the attack on Victoria. Despite the overwhelming evidence, Joe Sun continued to plead his innocence, but the DNA evidence was indisputable, so police charged Sun with 17 felony sexual offenses, which carried a maximum penalty of 275 years in prison. The case was handed off to a new deputy district attorney named Eric Scarborough, who was so new that at this point he had been on the job for a little over half an hour. With Sun behind bars, police began the hunt for his partner by putting out a bulletin to local media with Sun's mugshot alongside the sketch of the still unidentified accomplice. A couple of days passed before a man who wished to remain anonymous emailed police. He told them that he knew nothing of the crime, but went to school with Joe Sun and thought the sketch looked a lot like one of Sun's high school friends, but unfortunately he didn't remember the man's name. Police then spent months investigating Sun's known high school associates and eliminating potential suspects using the DNA they had on file. They also compiled a profile based upon what they already knew of the suspect. Eventually, it was determined that the profile matched a man by the name of Santiago Lopez Gaetan. Two Huntington Beach detectives then set up surveillance outside Gaetan's apartment complex, and within 30 minutes of arriving, they saw Gaetan drinking from a bottle of sun-kissed soda before disposing of it in the trash. As soon as Gaetan walked back into his apartment, the detectives immediately took the bottle and put it in an evidence bag. The bottle was then taken back to police headquarters and Gaetan's saliva was then compared to the DNA they had on file from the 1990 attack. 
and it turned out to be a complete match. Gaetan was immediately arrested, and police discovered that not long after Victoria's attack, Gaetan had moved from California to San Antonio, Texas, where he had gotten married and had children, seemingly pretending as if nothing had happened. With both men now behind bars, DA Scarborough made a shocking discovery. It had taken police so long to identify and charge both men that the statute of limitations on rape and kidnapping had expired meaning that there was a very real possibility that despite the inarguable evidence, both Sun and Gaetan could be released from jail and get away with their crimes scot-free. But Scarborough refused to accept this, and spent an entire weekend reading over the entire case file, and eventually he came up with the idea to charge Sun and Gaetan with torture. Since torture carries the possibility of life in prison, there is no statute of limitations in California. This fear of potentially being sentenced to life in prison if the case were to go to trial convinced Gaetan and his attorney to work out a plea deal, where Gaetan would admit full responsibility for his actions, and in exchange he was sentenced to 17 years in prison. Sun, however, continued to proclaim his innocence, and so a trial by jury was ordered, which began three years later in 2011. Victoria testified against Sun and spoke to the court about Sun's actions that night as well as the lasting trauma that has haunted her ever since, saying, quote, the post-traumatic stress disorder is with me daily as I have triggers that set me off. I feel debilitating fear come over me and am convinced a hand is coming from behind again. My emotional scars are intense. My 20s were stripped away from my life as I relearned how to walk, see, hear, and cope with the outside world again. Joseph's son not only cost me my job at my salon, but also my college savings, not to mention the impact it's made on celebrating Christmas year after year. Sun chose not to testify in his own defense, but had repeated outbursts during the trial, screaming, that's a lie, or you made that up, when evidence against him was presented. Ultimately, the jury deliberated for only a couple of hours before finding Joe's son guilty and sentencing him to seven years to life in prison. This meant that theoretically, Joe Sun could be paroled and a free man in as little as seven years. But just one month into his sentence, prison guards rushed to his cell after hearing a commotion. Upon entering the cell, they found Sun standing beside the door and his cellmate Michael Graham lying unresponsive on the bottom bunk with multiple marks and bruises on his face. Sun reportedly told the guards, quote, I told you I needed to get out of here before nonchalantly going to wash his hands. Graham was rushed to the hospital but died just an hour later, with the cause of death being determined as blunt force trauma due to punches and kicks. Sun was convicted of manslaughter and was given an additional 27 years, meaning that he will now have to serve 34 years in prison before being eligible for parole. Thank you for watching, and if you liked this video and would like to see more videos like this, please like and subscribe. Thank you, and I will see you next time.